good afternoon, everyone. I want to congratulate all of you on getting here fast enough to get a lunch and apologize to all of you who didn't. Um, we are apparently the only lunch briefing happening on Capitol Hill today. And uh, we apologize to everyone who scurried here, um, but hopefully Capitol Hill is not disappointing, um, which is a pretty high stake. Um, so thank you, though, for joining us for this October edition of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. Uh, my name is Aubrey Neal, and I'm Federal Affairs Manager at the R Street Institute. Uh, every month, we partner with New America to host these monthly lunches to bring attention to some of Congress's biggest uh, capacity issues, anywhere from staffing to obviously congressional tech. Uh, we've handled budget reform process before, and every month we try to take on some new topic that hopefully um, congressional staffers will find interesting, not only to kind of identify the topic, but also to foster discussions on solutions. So um, today, as you know, we're here for a discussion titled Time for an Upgrade, Getting Better Tech for Congress. And I'm very excited, and we're very lucky, to have two of the most dedicated people in D.C. on this topic here joining us today. Um, so first, um, right next to me is Daniel Schumann. He's Policy Director at Demand Progress and is a tireless advocate for solving issues that concern government transparency, accountability reform, and the overall strength of Congress. Um, he is co-founder of the Congressional Data Coalition, as well as Director of the Advisory Committee on Transparency. Um, and then to his left, we have Lorelai Kelly. Uh, she's a data and digital fellow at Georgetown User University Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation. Um, there, she leads the Resilient Democracy Coalition, which assesses how data, technology, and new engagement methods can help build a more resilient democracy with a focus on Congress. Earlier this summer, her extremely timely and insightful report um, on modernizing Congress came out. It's called Modernizing Congress, um, Bringing Democracy into the 21st Century. Uh, and that will actually be kind of the foundation for our discussion today. Um, it's a pretty long report, actually, just because of how many different things are covered. So she did tweet it out this morning, and you can also find the link to the report in the R Street events um, description of the event. We also have three copies of here, at least mine, and I'm probably not going to scribble on, so if you are the first one to get me after the event, you can get my black and white double printed side copy, um, but otherwise it is available online. Uh, so to kick off the discussion, um, I wanted to start, uh, obviously, with Lorelai, with the creation of the House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, which I hope you have all heard about, and if you haven't, go Google it. Um, when the House Select Committee was looking at things to modernize, a lot of outside coalition groups and staffers definitely created a bucket list of things that we wanted the committee to look into, and a lot of them were very tech-focused. And so, in many ways, we're kind of trying to hone in on the biggest tech capacity issues with Congress, um, Lorelai's report was really kind of the exact resource that everyone was looking for. So, um, Laura, I was wondering if you could please um, walk through your research, the challenges that you discovered that Congress faces, and some of your ideas for reform. Sure. Um, let's see. Okay, is that better? Uh, thank you. This is my Twitter handle, which is at Lorelai Kelly. If you want to uh, pull up the report, this is what it looks like. The pretty uh, cover version. So, I want to start out by getting people motivated about um, what the right now, and you, if you work here, if you work in and around Congress, uh, what you might be able to do in the coming years. So first of all, I just want a little bit of a thought experiment. Just if you sit here and look around, this is the most important and powerful representative assembly in the world. Congress has the power of life and death. It has the power of spending. It is the most diverse and potentially inclusive representative system in the world. I can argue with you uh, about other possible uh, parliaments and legislative bodies that could come close, but nothing comes close to the first branch of government. And we, in the last 20 to 30 years, have let it become derelict and the roof falling in. Take this for an example. In the last two years, or in this year, in fact, Americans are going to spend more the musical, a musical about the founding of this nation, a musical that shows how people died and sacrificed for this democracy. So we're going to spend more, or has made more money than two years of spending on the U.S. Congress on the system of maintenance for this place that you work in every day. We should be indignant and um, appalled by what's happened over the last 30 years to the first branch of the government. Congress is the beating heart of that, and we now at least are aware of what has happened. What has happened is not an accident, it's been an outcome. It's been decisions that were intentionally made that disempowered Congress 
with respect to the executive branch. This has happened in both parties and in all kinds of leadership, and it's our chance right now, because Americans are demanding it, and we're sitting here today to talk about it, that we can build a truly representative democracy in the 21st century. We couldn't have done this even eight years ago, even five years ago, but the fact that Congress itself, this institution and the people working here, have made the decision to change. This report I wrote <laughs> a couple of times before October. The one that I wrote was much longer and more academic. I threw it out last January and wrote this in about four weeks because the uh, Special Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress got created. And the other report I had written just wasn't that relevant anymore. So what I did with this report was write it basically as a directory for you. Read the footnotes. It's full of resources and names of people that are here to help modernize Congress. So this conversation has been happening kind of underneath the radar screen for a number of years now. Uh, there are a number of informal groups and more formal groups working inside Congress. Daniel can uh, talk about those at length. Um, but I'm just going to say what I did for the research that uh, that is in this report. One of the things that I think we have the potential to do now <clears throat> is devolve Congress more out into the state around 900 district offices in the United States. Those are the frontline interaction with Americans, but it's gone from 30,000 constituents when Congress was founded to 750,000 something today in each district. So members have this overwhelming sort of tsunami of representative duties that we're just coming to terms with now, and we definitely don't have the technology to handle it. We probably have two devices. Look at how many devices I have uh, that members run around with. They have, you know, their iPhone to you know, talk in a secure way, and then they have the issued one from Congress. I had the chance to work with um, and meet a number of the new members uh, at their orientation, and I got to say they are rev revved up and ready to go with inventing what we need to have next, and the experimentation is, is what we need to do now. So I focused on district offices. And the potential to basically um, devolve or decentralize functions of Congress more into the states focused on policy making. So Americans, but also in democracies, citizens in democracies around the world are demanding more participation in their own self-governance outside of elections. This is happening uh, everywhere. You can look at crowd.law. There's a project at New York University that has a, just a comprehensive list of how parliamentary systems are including more people in the policy-making process of monitoring, of, of the formative process, of ideas sharing, of, of the evaluation and the metrics afterward. Here's the big problem, though. Congress is not a parliament. It's really not a parliament at all. And in fact, I would argue that one of its biggest problems right now is this tendency to want to shove this one-size-fits-all, top-down, hierarchical model onto it. It's not built to serve in that way. And I think that's one of the reasons it's kind of stopped working. Members are required to represent. They go back to their district, and they feel cut out of their own workflow right now because of the hierarchical top-down model that largely uh, the parties have imposed on the institution. And so there's a chance right now within the rules of the institution itself, because if you look at the bone structure of Congress, it is really an amazingly representative system. It's just obsolete and old and not fit to work in the modern world. Um, so the organization is there, but the upgrade is, is coming. So what I did in districts was figure out where public serving information and the structure for that already existed, and how members and their district staff, working together with their Hill staff, could start creating a more inclusive uh, supply chain of information into the thought process of Congress. And we found that there's a huge uh, sort of empty space right now in the formative process of gathering ideas for lawmaking. So this is before a bill gets dropped. And then there's a whole other set of things we can do with new collaborative editing platforms and um, all kinds of sort of mission statements for bills. And we can talk about that because we're already piloting some of these things in committees and with members in their, in their states and districts. Um, but the, the, the other piece of this that's happening right now is Congress as an institution and democracy around the world is really sitting at this intersection of 
ideology and greed, just to put it really bluntly. Uh, the, when the last time America faced a global existential threat of ideology, fascism rising in Europe, World War II, the greatest generation, the defense industry came together and decided that survival of democracy in this nation was more important than their profits for a while. And they came together to defeat this global menace. In my view, the tech industry should be doing that right now for democracy. And I don't have any uh, sympathy anymore for talking to the tech industry about fitting Congress and democracy into their business model. This has to be the first. It has to be the first priority, and it can't wait in line anymore. So I come from, uh, originally from Silicon Valley, and I went to school there, so I feel a little bit comfortable being able to say that. Um, I just came back from San Francisco. San Francisco, if you go downtown, looks like Blade Runner. If you haven't seen the movie, uh, if we leave civics up to, or if we leave democracy up to Silicon Valley, we're going to have perfect pizza and fewer voting rights. It's not going to end well unless this institution stands up for the values of a resilient representative system. I'll talk about what we can do in the Q&A. But what I did in districts was basically work with three members, Representative Rick Crawford from Arkansas, Seth Moulton from North Shore, Massachusetts, and Jim Cooper from downtown Nashville. So we did an urban, rural, and suburban district. They all had different needs, but they, every single one of them was working to create a trustworthy, uh, authenticated method for getting more information from their own constituents, both affiliated expertise like people with degrees, but also lived experience like a farmer in the Delta. How do we get that information into policymaking in a world where information is continually being more and more weaponized to the point where we now have to deal with a computational propaganda? So a lot of what we need to do is go back to basics and go back to humans showing up at least part of the time in a room and solving these problems together. The good news is we're really good at that. And we need to rediscover the modern version of that. And I won't go into what I documented in here, but I'm happy to share everything that I learned, plus the research agenda, which you can take back to your own district and ask those same questions. And I spent 16 months in districts with members asking these questions about who do you trust, where can we build a knowledge commons for Congress that's decentralized, like through libraries, through maker spaces, through public and land grant universities. Um, and all of the, like I said, all of the system is there. It's just not connected in a way. We even have the laws that allow for it already. And um, again, I'm here to help you do that because we're now, for the next two years, through Georgetown at the Beck Center, we'll be looking at models of experimentation, of bringing uh, a civic voice into the workflow of policy. Well, thank you so much. Um, and then, Daniel, what do you what do you think about text capacity issues, and where do you really see the highlight being with um, where kind of the select committee needs to concentrate, and also kind of the both the low hanging and high hanging fruit of where you think that staffers and members should concentrate? So a great question. Thank you so much for having me in Laurel. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, no notes. <laughs> so so uh, as you were saying, I had sort of three things, uh, three major points that that struck me. Uh, the first one is. You know why is there this dysfunction, and, and, and the dysfunction around technology in Congress mirrors, mirrors the dysfunction in Congress itself. Um, when you look at the way that Congress functions, the way that it's structured, there are multiple silos. Like everybody kind of does their own thing. You have uh, what's what happens at the Library of Congress. You have House offices, uh, personal committee leadership. You have support agencies. You have everybody sort of does their own stuff. The level of coordination is fairly low. And when you look at the technological support that exists out there, most of these things were developed to solve a particular problem at a particular time. And then it sort of hangs on. So uh, if, you, if you look at uh, the development of the constituent management systems that folks use and sort of the, the, the way they interrelate, you know, like they evolve a little bit over time, but they're, they're still pretty similar to what I was using when I was on the Hill 20 years ago. Uh, if you look at the um, Webster, which is the internal uh, Senate communications platform, it's gotten a little bit better in terms of like helping to provide knowledge folks, but it's still that same kind of uh, uh, model of access to information. There 
isn't really a centralization of efforts. Uh, there really isn't anybody who has responsibility for looking holistically across the entire legislative branch. While you have folks inside different pieces, there's someone inside the CAO, there's someone inside the House Admin, who looks at part of this. There isn't that level of sort of uh, coordination across like all the different silos, uh, which is what helps make the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress super interesting. Because at least in the context of the House of Representatives, you start to see sort of this, this bridging, uh, looking across the different silos that, that exist. Even some of our language here is, is um, tricky. Uh, folks talk about there being um, 435 offices in the House, like there are 435 different businesses. Well, they're not. One, they're not businesses. I know people give me a business talking point often. Um, but they're also, you know, they're in the business of government. They're inside the first branch, the legislative branch. They, the committees, the leadership offices, the folks in the other chambers, like all this is interrelated. And when you think about it as everything being sort of separate, that leads to um, people building the same solution again and again and again in different places. The lack of resources, the resources aren't pooled, they're all sort of separate in these different uh, entities. Um, things are getting better. Uh, Congress is only about 20 years behind, uh, which is much better than 10 years ago, we were 30 years behind. So uh, we've made it into the information <laughs> age. There's now internet access almost every place. I know that folks won't believe that getting like Wi-Fi was actually a problem in the buildings here, but it was actually a real problem uh, until fairly recently. We're seeing changes. Uh, Ten years ago it was Thomas, now it was Congress.gov, which is a, a change in platforms. We're seeing the development of new tools to do things like show how an amendment would change a bill and a bill would change a law in real time. So we're starting to see some of these bespoke efforts to solve particular aspects of these problems. But we're not connecting it all together yet. Uh, James Craft, uh, uh, when he was with the Open Gov Foundation, was trying to build, for example, a better constituent management uh, platform. Part of what he was trying to do was when a constituent calls a member office to take the data that comes across when you answer the phone that says the person's name and the person's phone number and have that travel all the way over to the computer so you don't have to type that information in. Um, but there are different people responsible for different parts of this web. One is a vendor, one is the CAO. If you're trying to tie it to legislation, then it's going to be the clerk's office. Like all these are different silos and different pieces, which goes back to the point before that while we're solving particular problems, we're not solving a sort of a holistic uh, 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 way of, of addressing all of these problems. Um, fortunately, we are at, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a unique moment, but we are certainly at a, at a bit of a tipping point. For the first time in a very long time, uh, and a very long time would be since like the mid-70s, so a very long time, uh, there is a realization that Congress isn't functioning right. Um, we have every 30 to 40 years an effort to sort of reform the way the legislative branch works. The last time we went through this process, uh, we ended up with things like the Congressional Research Service. We ended up with reforms in the way that committees operated. Uh, there was a failed effort to do this in the 90s, but this is the first time really that we're thinking again systematically, holistically, uh, how to actually make the legislative branch work as if it's the legislative branch. Part of what's driving this in the House in particular um, is the nature of uh, the executive branch that it's dealing with and the fact that Democrats only control the House right now. So a lot of their work isn't focused on pushing legislation, but there's an ability to actually think inwardly about how the systems and the processes work. So you can ask questions around, like, is the Office of Law Revision Council doing the things that it needs to do? Is the House General Counsel, do they have sufficient resources when you're dropping, you know, like, those types of questions that you wouldn't necessarily think about otherwise are the types of questions that are emerging. Even, even uh, uh, super esoteric ones, like how does the appropriations process work? Is it pushing enough money towards the legislative branch? The answer, of course, is no, it's not. But at least this is a question that's being asked, which is a question that wasn't being asked two or four or six years ago. Uh, so there is hope. Uh, the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress with, uh, is providing a focal point for some of these conversations. Um, but I would suggest a few things to all of you. The first is that there are other stakeholders at play. There's the leadership, there's the Democratic Caucus, there's the Republican Conference, there's the Committee on House Administration, there's the Ledge Branch Appropriations Subcommittee. These are all the folks that have responsibility for different pieces of the pie. And it's important to be talking to them about the things that you're noticing that's creating the problems for you. And that's the second point that I wanted to make, which is that while you know, I've made the last 20 years of my life a study of Congress, you are the ones who know where the problems are. You're the ones who know that if you want to do a side-by-side -side on a bill, that it takes hours to do this when a tool could do this for you. That if you want to figure out who your life 
likely or unlikely allies might be inside the legislative branch, because you have the dear colleagues over here, and you have the bill of <coughs> over here, and the voter information over there, it's very hard to go and figure out who the possible person you might be collaborating with. And this, these are the types of things that can be solved by technology. We shouldn't be throwing humans to solve cert at certain types of problems. And we have an opportunity, at least for now, to think about how we can address those problems from a technological perspective. And the final thing that I would suggest is that Congress is good at a lot of things. One of the things it's really bad at is thinking about itself as an institution and, uh, ironically, institutionalizing that thought process. Like there isn't a place, there isn't an office of congressional foresight, right? There isn't a place where uh, stakeholders from the different parts of the institution can come together and think about how do we modernize technology, how do we address these other problems. It is worth thinking about how do we institutionalize this aspect inside the legislative branch so that we're not having this conversation again in five years or in ten years. So uh, thank you, Laura, your presentation was awesome. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'm excited uh, for the conversation ahead. So kind of the first thing I wanted to kind of open up for questions is I'm actually going to ask the audience and um, the panelists the same question, I'm going to do the panelists versus the audience so we start to think about it, but um, I know I am a recovering Hill staffer, and I still remember, and it still amazes me, that to do co-sponsoring of bills, you have to send your intern down the hall to actually have members sign a piece of paper. Like that's a really simple example of something that it seems so normalized in Congress, but really shouldn't be something that is a hard copy. Even the fact that um, there is just still fax machines in most offices and that they're actually expected to be used is something that seems completely out of place with where Congress really should be. And so um, kind of the question for everyone in the room is, what do you identify as the biggest kind of daily tools or processes that Congress uses that would be so more effective, so much more effective if they were modernized to have a tech component or where you guys see the holes being with where Congress really needs to modernize, like kind of your low hanging fruit or your wish list. So panelists first. I think it's actually in the information ecosystem. Sorry, that is a super vague answer. Let, let, me, be, let me be very specific. Um, one of the biggest problems in Congress is congressional turnover. Right? Staff are not here for all that long. And there's a lot of things that drive that. But one of the consequences is that staff often live in, uh, it's, it's very hard to get um, information about what's happened previously. If you've seen, I'm sorry, I'm going to do the thing that I've done before. So you're a staff, right? You've got HR123 right here. Congress, it's still your ass to evaluate to figure out. There's a Senate companion. You may or may not know that, right? CRS may or may not have identified it. I used to work at CRS. The folks in the office next to mine with the legislative information system, they may or may not have found the companion bill. Maybe it's the same, maybe it's not. There's no really good way to know. And what you really can't know is that this bill in the 116th had one in the 115th and one in the 114th. That's basically the same bill. And in the 114th, there was a hearing, there was a markup, there was a statement of administration policy that came from the White House, there was a GAO report. But if you're pulling out HR 123 and the 116th, you wouldn't know any of this other stuff. And you certainly aren't going to know the dear colleagues that came out. You won't know what the voting records were for members that are still in the House. If this is hours and hours and hours and hours worth of work if you want to sort of generate this legislative history. But this is all susceptible to technology. This is data. Like, you already have this. This is all in structure data form, you can already pull it all together, but the tools haven't been built to let you do it. And some of the pieces that you might need might be missing, um, but generally speaking, it's all there, it's just not assembled, and it can take hours and hours and hours if you want to do that. So my suggestion, like the, the low-hanging fruit, is connect the pieces, connect the dots, have something that makes the staffers smarter at the point they're trying to solve the problem. Because what we don't want, which is what was the case now, which is that you rely on people like me who are federally registered lobbyists to tell you what happened 10 years ago. Um, there is nothing wrong with having people from the outside having opinions. But when it comes to facts about what happened before, you should have your own independent, dedicated sources of this information. And I would suggest that technology can help um, make that uh, significantly better. That would be incredible. Thank you. Yeah, that kind of like to the Data Fusion Center for Offices, I hear a lot. It's just the reach back capacity. So the good news here is that um, a lot of Americans don't have sort of state-of-the-art industry standard technology. I'm from the Four Corners, a horse farm in northern New Mexico. It takes two hours to watch Seinfeld. Um, <laughs> we, it's always, <laughs> you have to let it download for 15 minutes and it stops. But then everybody's asleep in the living room before anybody watches it. 
So um, that's uh, the good news is that there's a lot uh, of, of uh, people who identify with Congress. Um, one of the things that I found uh, in the districts and the district offices is this idea of how do you create structured data in one of the most unstructured, serendipitous, almost random places in the universe. I mean, people write amendments on the backs of napkins. Uh, people vote like the person they had lunch with. <laughs> or you got off the elevator with. Uh, I worked on the Hill for 10 years. I was the national security staff for the Hill. So uh, besides the system being secure, that is the overarching uh, need for us. And in some ways, Congress, I think, is still pretty safe because it's like an upstate New York water system. There is no machine control, so you couldn't make it down. But that's going to change. The sort of industry standard for business enterprise architecture and uh, business intelligence, all of the stuff that Daniel just mentioned, it exists. It exists in the private sector. We need a public serving version of that. We need to be able to afford it. We can't keep uh, uh, jerry-rigging solutions here. The one thing that I noticed um, for sure in terms of policy making and allowing more people in that in the process is we need institutional upgrades of like the ethics, uh, the, um, the franking rules, the content model of Congress and the uh, um, the ethics rules in some ways, like right now, uh, land grant and public universities have yeah. access to Congress in a way that I, in my view, protects data that's coming in, so it can't be purchased and gained uh, nearly as much as if we just leave it open with no way to sort and filter the information coming in. So. <coughs> Simply having the institution come up with the rules of engagement for itself would be a huge step forward. Um, because if, you, if we don't do that here inside the Congress, um, like Daniel said, people try different things. They're bootstrapping all kinds of solutions with Code for America and with the computer science department at the, the school down the street. Everything from sort of a text thread at a town hall meeting to um, you know, a makerspace that's trying to help on legislation for sustainable ocean policy. These are actually real things that I saw when I was out in districts. Another one that I thought Rick Crawford did really well was um, he created a sort of citizen working groups around each of his committee assignments. So he had a sorting and filtering mechanism that was human and authentic and based on relationships that he had known for years that was open and actually able to do sort of policy thought work while he wasn't even in town. This is somebody who it takes 12 hours to drive between four district offices. I think the only other person who has such a big district is Steve Pierce in southern New Mexico, but he was a pilot. <laughs> so he could fly <laughs> out and do all these random things. He could actually do the FaceTime in a way that uh, Mr. Crawford can't. So here he is driving. There's all kinds of opportunities. One of the other things I saw that's simple is, is uh, Members use their YouTube channels uh, very uh, poorly right now. And that's a way that if you had a partnership with like your local state land grant community college for people to do uh, issue backgrounders in video format for members. Like to me, these kinds of rules that, that, that you know, one of the things we need to do for sure for the system to improve and survive in the long term is get the conflicts of interest out of the supply chain of information. At the very least, we should be able to create an auditable supply chain of information into Congress. That means we know who pays for what information. Or if it's just because citizens are getting together who have really good experience and knowledge and want to help. I saw examples of this, and people ask for this all the time, just a Q&A widget on a member's website when you have an Ebola hearing, and they want to hear from veterinarians who had experience in West Africa in their district. And believe it or not, those people do exist everywhere. <laughs> you can really, we have, what, 300 million something, or, you know, people in this country that have amazing experience. There's no reason that they should be shut out like this. Um, so, I know that wasn't a precise example, but the one example I'd give that we have already done is if we want to create a common knowledge pool for policymaking, there's a way to do that in the rules right now. We just ran something called a side hearing in New Hampshire with Ms. Uh, Representative Custer and, and Mr. Pappas, where they had about 30 people to come in and talk about PFAS, which is a groundwater poisoning problem. And these are people 
that had already worked with a lot. And children have been productive and helpful and good local citizen resources already. And what we did just was simply create a form that hashtag Civic Voice, PFAS, New Hampshire 1 and 2, and the date. So that can be discoverable now in a machine readable Congress as a Civic Voice on PFAS. You can do that. So we have them do that, and then the members can enter it into the record or into the extension of remarks back in Congress. So as long as we can keep filling this sort of civic voice pool, we have a more human, authenticated method of policy from the districts. And we're not doing it at the last minute. And then the question becomes, how do we create this you know, public serving search engine, civic search, basically, so that there's a huge piece of civic voice and experience that Americans with uh, who've lived through the Flint water crisis, for example, or through PFAS, or any number of issues in the supply chain of information and the policy. But to me, that's not rocket science. Like, we can build that in the next few years. And what we can do here is start tagging that. And I can help you build a form. We couldn't get the digital form in New Hampshire yet because of actually rules about what kind of distance testimony is allowable, and what vendor you're using, and then all of a sudden Zoom had a huge security flaw, and then Slack had a huge. So there's issues right now. That's one of the biggest problems is that since Congress really can't afford its own state-of-the-art communication system, um, people are just trying with whatever they have. They're getting waivers for stuff, and then you know when people submit testimony. Security should just be a, this is critical infrastructure. Your legislative branch is critical infrastructure. So how do we get it upgraded on that, but also start building this reach back capacity that Daniel mentioned? I'm not a techie, but I definitely could point people into the right direction of who's doing this well in the industry. And in my view, they should be building it for us for free. Assistant LC. I think I have a, it's a lot of those like really small things that just take up a ton of time and don't need to, and a lot of it is because it's these decentralized processes. The very first thing on my list that I was telling my interns about earlier was why are we going to the cook room like every 10 minutes with a new co sponsor request? So, definitely that one. Um, I started doing appropriation season, and just the like. <laughs> Day to, yeah, the day-to-day -day of it was crazy to me. Like We were having interns running around collecting signatures like within two hours, and you only had this small window to do it. And then I was there till 9 o'clock at night filling out the form online, like ranking your order. And if you accidentally ranked the wrong one, sometimes you had to start over. And like just like a really just easy. Form. Yeah, yeah. Like the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like let's just make it a million times easier. Um, flags and tour request systems, again, if those were just not decentralized, I mean, we're, there's a ton of tedious extra work for member offices when we're just the middleman for all these other 10 offices I'm, like, talking to back and forth every single day for no reason. Um, and then same with booking rooms, like, you have to go through a different 
system for the CDC or the House side or the Library of Congress, like if you just want, if someone tells me to get a room, I like block off two days in my schedule to just figure out how to get them a room because like they fill up and the website doesn't work and then you have to call them and like that person and then like we get these emails back that's like you need to fill out 12 different forms and have the number sign it and it, um, and then same with the trainings that are required, like I feel like I get a different answer every time. Just the r mandatory trainings that all staffers and interns have to do. Like the ethics and yeah, the and design. I get a different answer each time about like which ones are actually required and which aren't, but I know there's at least like four, yeah, workplace, which you have to do online or can't. And again, it's like a different system to sign up for each one. I have a staffer who just started, he's been here for four, four weeks now and we still haven't gotten him to sign up for all his trainings because something will be broken someone tells me to go somewhere else to fix it and like there's not just one place where I can go and like sign up for all my trainings which I think would be really helpful um, okay I think that's, that's it <laughs> that's great it's so helpful honestly yeah yeah I just reached out to my staff with this question um, he'd like to know have Congress considered domaining a bespoke piece of software to scrape the web for Texas and sort of output that into various forms oh, that exists it does yeah so Derek Willis said ProPublica has built a tool that pulls down all press releases for, uh, I think it's, it may, I know it's all personal offices, it may be community as well, uh, but it's available, um, Derek's not here, I, I, can't, I can't remember what it's called, but there, there's also an API behind it for, for ProPublica. If you come up to me afterward, I can, I, I will remember by the time you come up uh, what it is, but yeah, there, you can search through it. Um, it used to be like called a con related, like they, all, all these tools have terrible names. Is it, is it represent? Is it hard to represent? But there's a there's a particular name for the anyway. We'll, we'll talk about it. Yes, but the, the, the press clips exist. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things that I just mentioned there's also there's this huge opportunity for people to work with this new sort of generation of community information and new forms of participatory news making. Like, what if some of that was formatted for Congress while they're collecting the news anyway? Harkin is one of them. Uh, document is one of them where citizens are going, what happens when local news uh, dies off or gets bought up by a like, national syndicate is it becomes much more expensive for that community to borrow money. They actually become less valuable in the eyes of investors. And that's that Bloomberg piece that's actually cited in that report if you want to see. Um, but that's one of the things that we found uh, is this huge opportunity if members would just connect with those new organizations. Are there any schedulers in there by chance? Or do they usually think of I'm always really curious where schedulers have the tech issues because I feel like they're an area where they don't have very much conversation. I remember um, horror stories of staffers running through view pocket cards because they remember a schedule just changed and they don't know how to use the app on their phone yet so they run with paper copies of their schedule. <laughs> so that's a great one. Might it be helpful? So there's a couple things that have changed yeah. that, that, that fit into this. Um, so one, Ted Henderson built um, Capital Bells. I don't know if folks, how many folks here use it, a handful. It's about 200 mem members of Congress use it the last time I checked. This tells you what the votes are going to be on the floor as they happen. Um, so that you get the, so that instead of trying to memorize what the bells mean, which I don't think anyone's ever done ever, uh, you can, it'll tell you what the vote is that's coming up on the floor. Um, there is, uh, so Derek Wills, uh, ProPublic has built a number of relevant tools that sort of fit in this space as well. Uh, we are launching, a, we have all of CRS reports at everycrsreport.com where you can download it. Uh, so you can read it on your Kindle, you can see how it's changed, which is often helpful because uh, different versions of CRS reports might change two words, but there's no way that you would know that. Uh, and we'll have a new thing, it's up now, but we, it's still an alpha test thing, it's called Bill to Text. So if you ever um, get a draft legislation from Ledge Council, they give it to you as a PDF, uh, which is very difficult to comment on. So if you put it on this tool, it'll give it back to you as a text file, so that you can then put it in Google Docs or Word and like collaboratively draft it, uh, or send it around for other folks for comment. Uh, and there are a number of other sort of things like that. Um, the um, the sign-ons for members that is currently being built, um, or it's no, it's, it's out for evaluation. And after the House admin, Susan Davis's office have requested something like that. Um, to, to, to what? I'm sorry. What is that sign on for members? Oh, so that instead of having to send someone around to like okay. sign on to the co-sponsorship, right? Christmas. 
So, so that's coming. And there's one other thing that's in the works now is being built. There should be a version of that soon, uh, which is being built by the clerk's office, which is uh, it's an implementation of the POSI rule. And what it would do is it shows you how an amendment would change a bill in real time and how the bill would change the law in real time. So the idea is that you're in a committee hearing or whatever, you can sort of push a button and it will give you the two different versions uh, so that you can understand, uh, 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 pushed up against like the US code. So you can actually see what changes. Um, that way you don't have to go through it and try to like unwind the whole thing yourself. It's, it's a very tricky problem to do. It, they've been working on it a couple years. But that should be coming soon. And there are other things as well. Um, oh, I have one other, which already exists is a, uh, a vote comparison tool. So you've got two roll call votes, and you want to know who stayed the same, who flipped, and who split. You can put in the two roll call votes for any vote between 1995 and present, and it will give you the split, and you can download the list of the spreadsheet. Um, so that, that, will, that helps you find allies uh, and also people who are involved with the whole thing. So, so there are efforts to do some of these things, but obviously like the, the list of eight things that you have, like these are really helpful. Um, for your tours, oh, there's the final, Melissa and Medina build tour tracker. Yeah, we use tour tracker. Yeah. Love it. It's so great. It, it doesn't. But it doesn't do every, you know, it's, it's not like a, I don't know how much that is a Congress problem as like working with all these different institutions. A fair part of it is a Congress problem. Um, if you store people's individual information, the level of requirements for that is significantly greater. What makes Tor Tracker work is that it doesn't store any data that is for like you no know, security numbers, no identifiable information. So they can maintain it off the congressional servers. Uh, that's what allows it to work better. Um, if, if the, the privacy requirements of like having that level of data and trying to keep it inside the congressional firewall means that it would be significantly harder to, to do it. It doesn't mean they can't be done, but the, the, the difficulty level is significantly greater, which is why it wasn't done that way. Yeah. And Melissa did a great job with it. It's a great tool, yeah. So in a similar way with the co-sponsoring bills, I also wonder if there would be a more digitally advanced way to uh, have people sign on to a letter that we're sending out. Um, because I know as an intern, I've run a letter around like 50 different offices in different places. Yep. And so, with that, now I know there are different ways that people have to add digital signatures to things. So I wonder if there's a way that they can build a system where you put the letter up there and everybody else can just add the digital signature that, on that. That, that hasn't been built yet. That is possible. So the, the issue that we're running into is vanity management. Uh, so do, do people remember when there was the doxing of a couple senators on Wikipedia? Um, during the Kavanaugh hearings? Okay. So what made that possible? Uh, two things. One was it was an insider threat. The, the former staffer who was working on the House side was able to have someone that get back in on the Senate side. But the other problem was these PIV cards, these cards that people have that are supposed to uniquely identify you when you log onto a machine, um, they w weren't in place so that uh, this person had just put a, a key logger and was able to get all the passwords. What you need to have something is a, something that identifies you as you. So that if you're signing on for your member on a, on a dear colleague or on a, um, a co-sponsoring a bill or whatever it may happen to be, there has to be a way to know that the person who is signing on is actually the person who they say they are and that they have the authority to do so. So once this tool is built, this, this um, uh, co-sponsoring tool is built, if it's sufficiently connected to identity management, it will make a number of other things possible, like what you've identified. Uh, but the real hard part has been proving that you are, in fact, you know, the LA with so and so who's authorized to sign into this thing or to these set of things. And this goes back to the point that was made, I think, at the beginning, which was about the contacts database. Who are the people in the office? What are they responsible for? How do you know it's them? Um, there's a number of RFPs out from the House and the Senate to do a lot of these things to purchase this technology. Um, but it's not fully ripened yet, so um, that, that's kind of what we're dealing with at the moment. Um, I just had one question. When I was coming to the office in the morning, I was like an intern, there's a lot of newspapers out there front door, which I didn't know if we can make a system that we make sense which papers we actually want because the majority of them get recycled, and I feel like that's just kind of a waste. How, are, are you guys you're not subscribing to them? They're just being dropped off? They just get dropped off. They say they're just like a curve. Mm. of like political or China daily or whatever, which... Mm. Well, I was 
controversy with the China Daily recently, right? <laughs> yeah. Is that heard around that? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answers to that. I, 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 knew, I do know that there's a lot of deliveries. I think it's like five deliveries a day unless it's changed when I was here for mail. Uh, and that there is some level of control that can be exercised uh, through the postal service. Uh, but I don't know about the other stuff. So, sorry. Yeah, I think we talked earlier. Uh, I'm Ken Phelan with uh, a technology company called Storm Center Communications. We do geographic information systems, which is geospatial mapping. Uh, we have an application called Congressional Situational Awareness. We can have Congress members know exactly what's happening in their congressional districts, no matter where they are, and then connect all their staff on any device. It's, it's like geographic location intelligence. An example, um, in March, when the tornadoes hit, I think, Georgia and Alabama, uh, we were able to at least outline the damage paths on three maps and send those to every member of Congress, to the governors of each state, and also to the director of emergency management. And everybody was on the same map addressing that situation, knowing what personnel was sent in, what demographics were affected, and how to best respond to it. And we can do that with almost any issue when it comes to opiates, opiate, uh, the opiate crisis, weather conditions, we deal with the wildfire in District 1 in California. So there is technology that can help Congress members uh, address situations happening in their districts on a real-time basis. We're funded by the federal government, so we work with NASA, NOAA, uh, Homeland Security, Department of Defense. But we began to introduce it to members of Congress. We've met with Senator Cardin twice. Um, there are other members of Congress that wants us to come and do demonstrations of this technology in their offices. And actually, can I just piggyback off that point? So obviously there's a lot of tools out there that, um, that can really benefit Congress on the inside, but all of it takes money for appropriations to get there. So with kind of the staffers who are here, what is something, and this is the last question for you guys before I turn it open to the audience, but what is kind of like the talking point or any recommendations that you have that these staffers can kind of take back to their member or kind of start conversations on the inside, either with constituents or like I said, kind of um, inter-staff conversations of how to encourage why this is worth the investment from appropriations or just from the committees to give attention to moving forward. I would just, I mean, I would just go from the big top line is that in a world where democracy is at risk, your legislative technology and digital infrastructure needs to be looked at as critical infrastructure. It needs to be secure, protected, and, in, and comprehensive. And we have models of how to do that. And if it's just emergency appropriations, if it's somehow, uh, I mean, the other thing I would say is, listen, we pay for this kind of comprehensive systems in other countries. We, pay, we spend billions of dollars on uh, democracy strengthening in other countries. I worked on the defense bill for years, and we have spent so much money on um, building you know, democratic systems, and we won't do that for ourselves. And so I think we have to sit down and take it to the national security level, take it up a notch. This first branch of government is critical infrastructure. If it can't compete in the modern era, we can't have a democracy that serves the people. That, to me, it's pretty simple is take it up to that level. This is a national security issue. We know it's at risk, and we have to start talking about it like that and funding it like that. So I think I would say three things. Um, so at the talking point level, uh, I would say that uh, Congress has significantly cut its funds. Funding for the House of Representatives is down 10% over the last nine years. There are 1,000 fewer House committee staffers than there was 25 years ago. There's 2,000 fewer people at GAO. The size of Congress from a congressional staffing perspective is down 20 to 30 percent, except in the personal offices. And in the personal offices, um, most of those staffs have shifted away from policy making work to do constituent service work. So uh, the goal is not to go in and create this centrally funded, extravagant, gold plated Congress, it's to get back to par. Uh, the goal is to simply get back to the capacity that we had previously that we gave away. Uh, I think that we should go further than that, but in terms of the talking points, it's a lot easier to argue for you know, restoring capacity back to the point that previously existed than trying to make arguments around what the right number should be. Uh, the two other things that I would suggest, um, uh, in, in this place out in the context of the, this really esoteric thing called the, it has to do with the amount of money goes to the, to the 12 appropriations subcommittees, it's called the 302B allocation. When you look at the number for the legislative branch, we're talking, I think the House passed $34 billion in 
increase for the non-defense, non-appropriate, non-defense, non-mandatory spending. And um, if 1% of that went to the legislative branch, we'd be back close to parity. Um, so like, we're not talking about a lot of money in the context of the increases that we're making in a lot of other spaces that would get us back to sort of start. And that's where we need to be, is we need to be dealing with a lot of these sort of institutional capacity questions, both for technology, but also making sure that like staff get paid appropriately, that you guys have the right level of benefits, that your security is okay, that everyone has the opportunity to work here. Like those types of questions I think are relevant. Uh, two other things I would just say very briefly. One is that if you're not aware of it, next week is the Legislative Data and Transparency Conference hosted by the Committee on House Administration. And this is the seventh year now that they've done it. It's bipartisan, bicameral. There are representatives from the Senate there as well as, well as from the support office and agency. And she cared about technology and you want to get a thing fixed, a thing tweaked, a thing changed. You want to run an idea by someone. The people who are responsible for building all this stuff and thinking through what your needs are, like the, the ones like not the, the folks who come to testify, but the ones who actually like are doing the nitty gritty, that's where you want to be. Uh, because this is the chance to talk with all of them and say, gosh, you know, if you just change this little thing on like Congress, like, oh, it would be 10 times more useful for me. Or if you would, you know, I, I know that you're building this tool for co-sponsorships, but if you'd also do it for like sign-on letters, like that would be super, like getting them thinking about that type of stuff. Like that is the place to have that conversation. It's day long. Um, it's really good. Uh, leadership from both parties will be there speaking. And the final thing I would just suggest very briefly is that uh, we put out a weekly newsletter called the First Branch Forecast. You can find it at firstbranchforecast.com. And it's focused on all of these questions. It includes highlighting things like, hey, there's this tool, this new tool that, that came online, or Lorelei's new report is out, um, or there's this conference coming up. It comes out once a week. It's a little lengthy, I apologize for that. Uh, but it's chock full of stuff that you probably won't see elsewhere. And it is, if you care about these things, and obviously you do since you're here, this is the easiest place to find a roundup of all the things that are happening that are relevant in this context. Okay. Go ahead, yes. I'm with I'm Eddie Altoona. I'm with uh, a tech startup for Hill Staffers. Uh, we're developing a, a social media platform for Hill Staffers. Um, and my question is, what do you think is the biggest obstacle for small tech startups and tech outside tech companies trying to engage government, uh, a very risk averse um, go uh, government and government employees? And uh, what do you think is the, but like, if things are not built internally within government institutions, how should a, how can a tech startup or outside tech company uh, best engage with a government and you know, what are possible solutions around that? Really quickly, have you seen the Lincoln uh, report and doing business with Congress? It's a really good, uh, and it's very recent. It's um, Zach Graves and his co-author are not remembering, but it's a really good overview of that exact question. And the entity is the Lincoln Network. Lincoln Network, yeah. Uh, and, it, and it talks through the, the procurement process. So it, part of it depends on like what you're trying to do. If you're trying to build things for use on the inside, the, it's very different. And this is true for government generally, Congress in particular. It, that's a very different question than building things for sort of the outside. Um, there are significant barriers to engagement, particularly with Congress, uh, because the House and Senate are, have different rules in the way that they deal with these things. They're, um, it's very it's easier to say no than it is to say yes. I mean, this is not to say that the people inside the even the Sergeant Arms, the HR, like they, they want to say yes, but like it it can be very involved at times. Um, and the result is that like with most government entities, you end up needing to be a big entity to be able to deal with the the process. If you're trying to do build on the outside while well, servicing folks on the inside, like Tor Tracker did, that's a different model, right? Like they they still can deal with staff, but they've set it up such a way that they avoid a lot of the problems of like trying to deal with sort of the inside. And the final piece that makes Congress a little bit even more strange is the speech or debate clause uh, that has implications about where information is stored and how the House can protect or the Senate can protect its information. Uh, a lot of this results from misapprehensions about the way this provision uh, of the Constitution operates, um, uh, which aren't actually barriers, but people think that they are. Um, but it adds an additional wrinkle that makes things even more complicated to deal with the executive branch. Isn't it just a big, um, oh, I see the little oh, yeah. yeah. just to um, look at the comparative advantage of the chambers. The House is far more of like the risk aggregator for the first branch. You can do a lot more on the, on the House side. The Senate, do we have any Senate staff here? Uh, when it comes to communication, <laughs> are you still just waiting for your 
flock of messenger pigeons to die. The smoke signals um, in terms of communication. I mean, I think there's just going to be a lot more showing up in person on the Senate side, but the really interesting place for that chamber to experiment is in the deliberative process. Because it's these six-year terms, there's more room for experimentation on deliberation. I can, uh, I can share a memo that I wrote on the comparative advantage of the chambers for communication. But the House is sort of younger. You had like 26 millennials elected last uh, year. Um, they're, just, they're much more in their districts, interfacing with people and needing to collect and structure information in a more helpful way. So I would just argue that um, the biggest challenge for us is going to be getting the chambers to share by default. So when I came to work on the Hill, I came in the late 90s, um, it was to replace some of the functions of what was called the Arms Control and Foreign Policy Caucus. And Daniel mentioned that the capacity of Congress on the staff level used to be much higher. So this was not just a Democratic and Republican you know, study group for members. It was staff with seven or eight people with really good topical information on a really nerdy topic, nuclear security. And um, but it was also shared between the House and the Senate. And there's really no reason that these chambers shouldn't be creating, again, like the civic voice knowledge pool, and that the Senate could take some of the risk out of the deliberative process. And the House could just be throwing the spaghetti on the wall constantly, figuring out what works, how you're going to structure it, and sharing it by default. Something I heard from Democratic, and I worked with both Democrats and Republicans when I was on the Hill. All my program in the Senate was with Senator Lugar, a great institutionalist, and on the House with a bunch of Democrats and Republicans. Um, was the willingness of people to share all kinds of information, especially formats, regardless of party, regardless of the sort of political process. And something we've really lost sight of, I think, as Americans, is the bright line between campaigning and governing. And the, the bigger problem is that the technology and social media available to us uh, makes uh, governing look like campaigning. And it's just constant. And we have to bring that bright line back, that this is campaigning and this is governing. And if we can't create a space for a thoughtful, deliberative process, we can't have the democracy that we want. Um, and so that's another thing that you can do back in your districts. And no matter how much technology we come up with, it's really still going to be people you trust in your community coming in person and talking. And I, and just to say this, uh, this, I think that what's happened in the civic memory hole that we've fallen into with Congress, it's a failure of, of, of leadership on the one hand, but it's a failure of citizenship also, on the other hand, uh, Americans need to step up to this. And I think that they're looking to their members of Congress to say, hey, come help me with this challenge. Hey, you data science meetup. Can we have a data science meetup about some of the needs of this district office? Or people want so badly, makerspaces are great sort of field hearing venues. Public libraries, they already have like uh, meet your rep or, or speed repping where you have uh, places set up in your library for people to connect indirectly with members. So this authentication process that Daniel mentioned, it's so vital. Like at the end of the day, this system, can, everybody is trying to game it. Everybody knows that. We have to figure out a, a, a system that works for authentic representation. And I also think at the end of the day, like you can't avoid showing up in person as humans and just doing the work. And that, I think, is going to be easier to do outside of D.C. Uh, I just wanted to build on your comment before about uh, the tech industry having the responsibility to do some of this stuff for free. And, and I agree with you. I just wanted to point out there are actually programs. I'm, I'm at a startup as well. And so if you go to some of the big tech companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and you ask and you demonstrate anything that you have kind of on the ball and they want to to you, they will. So, you know, it's not a Microsoft commercial, but in our case, we went to Microsoft and were able to get $120,000 in credit for Azure and for our site, which is www.markup.walk, which does a lot of great stuff. And there's my commercial. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, but it basically builds on Office 365 and allows you to put all the bills in Microsoft Word and redline them in one click. And then we're building it into Teams. And when you have Microsoft Teams, that'll be really cool. But the bottom line is, is whether it's us or 50 other startups that might be building on the platform that um, Congress has bought, namely Azure and Office 365, startups 
and even Congress itself that's working on projects, if you go to them, they're going to give you, you know, they want their platform adopted. So they're going to be really interested in helping you. So I would definitely say to anybody that's doing a startup or anybody that's working on projects, even in your office, uh, on your you know, side time, if you have any, just call up Microsoft and ask them for money and resources and software, and they're going to probably say yes. And uh, I would encourage everybody to do that with all the big tech companies uh, because they all want to make friends with you. Digital servers. We need something like the executive branch has, which is U.S. Digital Service and ATF. Hundreds of staff, hundreds of people brought in from the private sector to help the executive branch get up to speed. We need that as well. It's not fair. So we need them to not just give a demo example for free. We need an institute. It's hard to be an agile institution. I mean, that's kind of. Uh, so we've got to figure out what that looks like. What is the intermediary, the information intermediary, or somehow that, 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 that you know, I, I don't know if something like that exists in the IRS, like what would that look like? But we need to figure out something that's both agile and institutional and public serving. Um, but thank you for that, you're right. It's gonna be really, really expensive, and it's gonna be for a while. And so I want them to come up with that level. I mean, they have so much of our data for free already. We deserve this. Well, Daniel pointed out how much data available in the background to crunch, and mm -hmm. we're finding that as well. This, the cloud services, if you have to pay retail for them to actually crunch the data to get it into a usable format, is incredibly expensive. Well, we're not going to give away all that machine learning yeah. stuff. For yeah, but wait, wait until so, so you can get the best sort of machine learning algorithms based on how much data you have, right? Because they're practicing on that data pool. Um, if, if the private sector has all of that and the public sector doesn't, I mean, look at the fight with Uber and, and those companies over providing their transportation data to public service to cities. The cities need to just take them on, say, no, we pay for these roads. We pay for all of this. This belongs to all of us, this infrastructure for democracy, and you need to share it with us and get them to share by default. Like, this institution was built and became so successful and powerful because there's so much sharing by default built into the system. And we need to really reward that. And, and I think that that's another conversation we could have back at your office. What would your office be willing to just share with everyone? Anonymized, formats, uh, your colleague letters, information. What can you take out of it? I know the parties are, their heads are exploding right now. <laughs> They are, they're not serving, the parties are not serving this institution right now. And with that, the bell is the end of class. Um, so I think all the panelists, um, I think everyone's time willing really to stay around. If you guys have any last minute questions that we didn't get to you, please feel free to come up here. Thank you so much for attending. Um, for any kind of Ledge Branch issues, um, I recommend going and visiting either our street or ledgebranch.org. And thank you guys so much for attending the Ledge Branch Capacity Working Group. Thank you.